First of all, thank you to my friend Kyle for this housewarming plant. It is the only decorative living thing in this home besides me. As some of you guys know, I did buy my first house a couple of months ago and I will have the empty house tour linked up above if you didn't watch that video or if you want to watch it again. And I did get a lot of questions that I wanted to address about how I bought the house, the whole process, how I found my agent, how I financed it, and just the general spiel of that. So instead of doing a vlog like I originally wanted to do, I decided to just sit down and answer questions because I feel like that's much more informative and useful for you guys. I also cut this video into chapters so it's easier for you guys to jump around if you want to hear about specific parts of this process otherwise we're just gonna dive into the video so the top question i get asked all the time is why did i buy a house and in particular why did i buy a house in maryland so some of you guys might know that i am actually based technically in new york city for my job but ever since the pandemic started i've just been living at home in maryland and to be quite honest i thought it would be a very temporary and brief thing staying at home in maryland but it turned out to be way longer than i expected so around like the half year mark when I was staying at home, I had thought about moving out maybe to like an apartment nearby. And the reason I was even considering buying a house is because I know at some point I want to have a residence in Maryland near my family. My company kept on moving the work from home date back. So the question I was facing was between buying a house and renting a house. If you do buy a house, the house ends up being your own asset. But when you rent a place, that money goes to someone else. If any of you guys are stuck in this sort of dilemma about renting versus buying, there are calculators online that will let you plug in some numbers on how much your rent is every month and then how much you can afford in mortgage and then see which one's more uh, worthwhile. So I'm gonna leave some resources down below if that's of any interest to you guys. So for me, the primary purpose of buying my house was to have somewhere to live and stay while I was working from home and in Maryland. But if your objective is to invest in properties for rental income, I know there is a rental property calculator that I'll link down below and also compound interest calculators. You can compare how much you'd get from investing versus how much you would get from renting out your property. So I'm trying to make this as useful of a video as possible. So I will have all those links down below. After looking at rental prices and lease terms and all that, renting a sizable place in Maryland would actually be the same, if not even more expensive, than having a monthly mortgage. So all I really needed to fund was the down payment, and I will talk about finances a little bit later, but for me, I felt like it made more sense to just buy a home. So once I decided I wanted to buy a house, the first thing that I needed to do was find a good real estate agent. I have gotten the question on how I found my real estate agent when I was buying a house. I was assigned to a few real estate agents on different platforms, <laughs> And I got so many phone calls um, after signing up on these platforms. But the things that I was looking for when I was talking to these real estate agents was what area do they specialize in? Because some real estate agents do specialize in certain areas or are more familiar with certain areas. I was also pretty keen on seeing the response rate of different real estate agents. Since buying a house is a very stressful process, it is pretty important to find someone who will be prompt about replying to you, be prompt about sending in contracts and everything. So one thing I didn't know off the bat, because this was my first home purchase, is your technical only supposed to be talking to one agent at once so if you do want to shop around and look for a good agent it's better just to get on a call with them and talk through their experience and what you're looking for and see if they're a right fit and not actually go see the homes with them until you're confirmed to be their client I think it's on Redfin or maybe some other website where you can see the reviews of the agents but also like the homes attached in like the month and year of when the home was sold so you can see how frequently they sell houses or how frequently they close on homes with um, their clients and also get kind of a sense of their experience level based off of how many reviews they have and stuff like that so that's kind of what I used to decide on my agent so once I got my real estate agent down they obviously asked for my preferences in terms of what I wanted for the house but the other thing that they do typically ask you to do is to get a pre-approval of it uh, pre 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 why is it so hard <laughs> pre-approval letter and essentially what a pre-approval letter is is a letter from a lender that specifies the amount that you're qualified to take a loan out for an estimate of the interest rate that you'll be getting for your mortgage but the reason you need this pre-approval letter initially is because the process of looking for a house is pretty quick so if you do like a house and you want to put in an offer you also should have a pre-approval letter because it'll show the seller your eligibility for purchasing the home and getting a loan on the home if that's what you plan to do the other thing to know is that you do not have to go with the lender that gives you pre-approval letter. The letter is just an indicator that there is some lender out there that is willing to 
give you a loan for X amount of money. The next part is the funnest part of the house buying process, which is actually the house hunting. The requirements that I did have for the home I wanted was, I wanted it to be in the 200 to $300,000 range, and that turned out to be a little bit harder to do than I thought. I think at that point, the demand for homes was so high because mortgage rates were so low. Some other requirements that I had was I wanted a three to four bedroom home. I wanted some space that would allow me to bring my family over or you know later on when I'm older and I have kids and a family hopefully I could have you know a family house the other thing is I wanted a lot of sunlight and so that meant having east or south facing windows because you know east is for like morning sun and the south is for afternoon sun I think if we're talking purely about aesthetic or taste I wanted like a more modern contemporary style of home but I was mainly considering a townhouse versus a condo slash apartment apartments are generally more expensive in the HOA which is the homeowners association fees for condos the HOA fee could be anywhere from like $500 to $1,000 where I was looking so that's kind of expensive that's like the price of rent in some places the upside of that is that that HOA fee goes into like maintaining your building and maintaining your space on the flip side for a townhouse the HOA can be anywhere from $50 to $300 if you're looking at more upscale newer developments. And essentially what a lower HOA fee means is that if there's any damage or thing that you need to repair in your house, you would have to expense it yourself. But with a townhouse, you also have the ability to get more rooms, more space, a backyard if you'd like. So I wasn't too particular about the neighborhoods that I wanted, but I did have a few in mind that I would prefer. However, it turned out that my budget couldn't really satisfy the neighborhoods that I wanted. So I did end up moving a little bit outside of the area that I was originally looking at. So I gave my agent all my requirements and then he came back with a list of homes and from that I just picked out a few homes that I wanted to see. So the first home was $290 for their asking price which was within my range. I thought it was on the higher end of what I wanted but I still gave it a chance. So the houses were actually organized into this little cubicle looking space and there's a lot of sunlight coming from the top of this unit which I kind of liked. But this also meant that I would be seeing my neighbors very often because all the doors are facing each other. So I didn't know if I liked that. This place definitely wasn't renovated. So the home seemed a little bit outdated and run down. So for this house, you walk into the open layout in the living space. In total, there were only two floors though. So the upstairs floor contained all the bedrooms. The bedrooms did need to be repainted unless I wanted to be some main character in a Disney show. I really like the little kitchen island that they had. The kitchen felt very open and spacious, which I loved, but some of the appliances were pretty old, so I knew that that would have to be replaced. And the second house that I went to, I actually really liked. Uh, it was going for $290. It definitely had a smaller kitchen, so that was a downside. But on the left corner, there was a huge open skylight from the very top floor shining down, which my agent said was very inefficient. Like space-wise, that was just a terrible design decision. But aesthetically, I kind of loved it. I guess that's a trade-off, but this house definitely had a darker theme. The walls were painted in gray tone shade. The carpet was also a darker tone. And the one thing I didn't like was the bathroom on the second floor it was split up. So the shower and the toilet was in one small corner. And then outside of that little room, you'd have the sink area. I think that's a very European thing, but I just personally would prefer a bathroom with everything in it. However, <laughs> this home was right next to H Mart. It was like five minute walk from H Mart, which is my dream distance from H Mart. So location wise, I thought it was perfect. It had huge windows and they were all south facing, which meant there'd be so much sunlight. And as I mentioned, there was that skylight that is also possibly a safety hazard, I guess, but I wasn't really thinking that when I was looking at the house. But that was the second home and I actually liked it more than the first one. I was very heavily considering putting in an offer. But the last home that I was considering was 
this one. I already have a house tour video, so you guys can check that out up above if you'd like. But this home was slightly above my price point. The asking price was around 360 because this house feels a lot like a condo. I kind of just fell in love with the layout. I really like that it was super space efficient. There are four bedrooms in this house, which is more than enough. I think I put in like five different offers at different points in time. And the last one that I put in, which is for this one, ended up working out. So that's why I'm here. But the way that it worked for me after I decided that I wanted to put in an offer for a house was I told my agent a few things. So one was my escalation cap, which is the max price that I'm willing to purchase the house for. My escalation factor, which is the increments that I wanted to increase my offer by up until my escalation cap. My contingencies, so things like whether or not I would be needing an inspection on the house. The first couple of houses that I put in an offer for, I didn't waive my inspection, which meant that I would be able to go into the house and look at the house inspect it. Generally you're supposed to hire a home inspector but there are some things that you can do on your own like check the air vents, the windows open, check the water pressure and all that. A home inspection is typically a couple hundred dollars so for me it was three hundred dollars for the first home that I entered into a contract for. So once I told my agent all that information they drafted up the contract and then I signed everything in the contract. I read through everything a lot of documents to go through. And then what happens is that they send the offer to the seller. I'm not sure in a typical market if this happens, but since I was in a hot market, there was a lot of back and forth, like negotiating, competing offers, one-upping other offers. It was on the day of the offer deadline, the seller's agent would call my agent and say like, hey, someone has an offer for 10K above your escalation cap. Do you wanna increase your escalation cap? So the agent called me and they have an offer, the highest offer they have in hand is 15000 but he doesn't want to work with that agent, so he, he needs to, to get it done. And he's going to meet with the seller in an hour to sign documents. we got to get it to the two in 30 minutes. A part of me felt like that was a little scammy, but I guess as a buyer, you have to really weigh how much you want a house and how much you're willing to put down for a house. I personally don't like this whole bidding war that goes on, but in the current market that I was in, I just had to increase my amount that I was willing to offer, but I survived and here I am. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is financing. So once the seller actually accepts your offer, you have a certain amount of time that you can do an inspection. If you waive your inspection contingency, which in the case I did for this final house, that means you don't get that certain allocated period of time usually like a week to inspect a house and back out of the contract I forgot to mention but there are different ways that you can buy a house you can either buy it all cash which means you're just gonna pay it up front and not even take out a loan for this or you can get a loan like most people do and pay a certain amount up front which is your down payment and then the rest in increments or installments every month I definitely couldn't pay up front all cash even though my agent was trying to make me do that um, I could not afford that for me I was planning to do a 30-year mortgage with 20% down and the only reason I did 20% down is to avoid something called PMI which is private mortgage insurance um, essentially when you pay less than 20% the lender wants to know that you're gonna be able to pay everything else so PMI is essentially like some extra insurance on their end to protect the lender another question I get asked pretty frequently from you guys is how I afforded to buy a house so I did buy this house all on my own so no one else helped me finance this I had saved up money from all of my summer internships in college and also I saved up a ton for from working my first year and a half full time. One thing that I did learn is if you have a retirement account, you can actually draw from your retirement to purchase a house without any penalty. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, <laughs> I was pretty dumb in college, so I never invested any of the money that I earned in college. So all of that money was sitting in a bank account somewhere and I didn't have to withdraw from any of my retirement accounts because they were just sitting in my bank account. Honestly, I was just a really dumb and financially illiterate child. But they should really teach these things in college. I don't understand why they don't teach this to people. So once you know where your money is coming from, the next part is actually finding a lender. After the seller signs the contract and you sign the contract, you have a certain amount of time where you can find a lender. You can definitely go with whoever pre-approved you for your initial loan. However, the best advice I can give is just to search around. You can go with mortgage banks, direct lenders, local banks, I think, sometimes have good rates. So I ended up actually just using bankrate.com. It's one of those sites where you put in your information about your mortgage and then it'll bring up a list of lenders and their rates for today. That's one thing I didn't know that rates change every single day at like 9 a.m. or something like that. I got a rate quote once for 2.5. Apparently you can lock it in. <laughs> I didn't know any of this. So the next day when I went back to the lender, they were like, oh, the rate is 2.6 now. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what? 
Um, so yeah, if you find a good rate, you should definitely lock it in. Some lenders let you do something called floating down, floating up. I think it's floating down. Where if the daily rate is lower than your previously agreed on rate, they'll let you float down and get the better rate. Sometimes they charge for that and sometimes they don't even do that at all. So what ended up happening is I went with a lender for a rate of 2.99, which is super high. But at that time, the rates were going up again and I was just really scared. So I locked in that rate. And unfortunately, they don't do this floating down thing. So after I locked it in, the next couple of days, it just started dropping again. And I think it's back to like 2.6 now at the current moment that we're speaking. So woo, there goes my money. <laughs> but yeah, definitely keep that in mind if you're looking for a house, just lock in a good rate and see if there's any option to like float down if the rate ever goes down again. So on top of your down payment, which in this case was 20% of my mortgage, there's something called closing costs, which basically covers things like property taxes, loan origination fees, title insurance, escrow fees, so that definitely increases the amount that you're putting down initially. For me, the closing costs ended up being something like $15,000, which is crazy. But when you're looking for a house, definitely factor that in. Make sure you can cover both the closing costs as well as your down payment. The other thing that happened to me, so as part of closing on a home, the lender will send an appraiser to see your house and to inspect the house and assign some monetary value to it and confirm to the lender that your home is worth X amount of dollars. Usually they'll take some comparables from your neighborhood and see what homes have been sold recently at what price and then they'll use that as like a benchmark of assigning a value to your house. Honestly, a little bit subjective in my opinion, but that's fine. So what happened to me is my home actually appraised for lower slightly lower than the sales price. Say you buy something for $150, maybe a pair of sneakers, and then the appraiser comes in and is like, oh, this is actually only worth $100. The bank's not gonna want to give you a loan for $150 if that home's only worth $100, right? Because in any scenario that they would need to collect this asset, it's only worth $100 to them. So what happens is when you're getting loan, you might need to cover that extra cost or like the appraisal gap. That ended up bumping up my down payment a little bit more because I had to cover that appraisal gap. So in closing, there's some other miscellaneous things that you need to do, like get home insurance, but that's basically the gist of what happens. The whole closing process took about maybe a month or a month and a half. And at the very end, you get to sign a ton of papers on your closing day at the title company's office. And that's basically the process. And then they give you the keys and the house is yours. That was the process of how I bought my first house. I did film a little closing vlog, which I'll maybe insert at the very end. But I hope that was helpful if you're looking for a house or thinking of buying a house. This was not something I thought I'd ever be doing at this point in my life and I think the pandemic definitely accelerated that a little bit but I'm very grateful to have you guys here with me through this entire process. Also let me know if you guys have more questions you can leave it down below and I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise thank you for watching and I will just insert my closing vlog here. All right bye! We're at the place to sign for closing and the wind is so strong today. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, it's all about. Yeah, so I have all the signed documents, and that's pretty much it. I basically finished signing, and it was so many documents that it took like 30 minutes. Uh, and now we're done. Woo! Here are the keys, and we're being. Congratulations, done. Sarah. Thank you. Okay, that's all. Thank you. This is my post closing celebration. I got myself some Asian fish that I'm so excited about. And then also um, pickled bamboo. I don't know why I love these two things so much. 